This morning, as I share with you, I want to talk about uh, without first the marriage, God is not anyone's live-in partner. You know, I read an obituary once where it listed the uh, various people that were related and their spouses, and among the listings was someone listed as a loving partner. Uh, in other words, they were in a marriage-like relationship, but there were no, there was no marriage. You know, and I'm, I'm sure there's various reasons why uh, people choose to live together without uh, the commitment. But I want you to understand this morning that uh, the Bible teaches that anything outside of marriage, any sexual relationship outside of marriage is, of course, sin. And so this morning, I used to think it was the uh, males that wanted the benefits without the commitment, but uh, I've come to realize that it's also the females who uh, many times don't want to marry. So uh, this morning as we think about that, I'm not that concerned with today about living relationships. I want you to think about the fact that in the church, many church members, this has creeped into the church and we're thinking in terms of uh, I can be uh, related to God, I can be a church member and not have the commitment. Uh, you know, we tend to think that we can uh, relate to God without first committing to him. Uh, what the Bible is teaching us, and we're going to see in our text this morning, is that without the marriage first, in other words, of God, or the commitment, there will be no relationship. Jesus said it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how... Uh, much you want it. No, it doesn't matter how much it's becoming a part of what's happening today. Uh, before we can come to God, before we can have a relationship with God, we first must have the commitment. And I think that's uh, expressed clearly in the words of Jesus today in our text. We're going to find that in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. Listen to what Jesus is saying. He's speaking to Christians today. He's speaking to those that would follow him, those that would be in a relationship with God. The scripture says in Luke uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 25, said, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple." And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is speaking to us this morning, and first of all, he's saying to us that unless you are committed to an exclusive relationship with God, there will be no intimacy with him. You realize this morning that our world, of course, wants us to uh, accept their rejection of God. You know, there's many today they are saying there is no God and, you know, it's all a placebo and all of that kind of thing. They want us to agree with them. The world would have us agree with them that whatever they think is right is right. You know, they would have us to, to uh, have that attitude today. They don't want anything to be sin. But that's not what the Bible is saying this morning. I... Uh, some time ago watched a commercial for a mainline denomination and you know in that commercial they had a baby that was crying and suddenly it's catapulted out of the uh, out of the building you know it's thrown out and uh, then there was two men had their arms around each other and, and soon they're thrown out of the building and then later on there's someone that uh, appears to be very poor that's thrown out of the building and the uh, 
caption comes on and uh, says, God doesn't reject anyone and neither do we. <laughs> sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds good, but of course the message they were trying to, to get across was that you know, God accepts everyone, uh, even their deviant lifestyle. But I would say to you this morning that that is a lie. That is not what God uh, has said. In fact, as we look at this, the scripture plainly says that God does welcome everyone. He wants everyone to be his child. He wants everyone to have a relationship with him. But we must come God's way. We have to come through repentance. Do you realize what repentance is? Repentance is going your way and you realize the wrongness of it and you turn around and begin to go God's way. Unless we come through repentance, unless we acknowledge that we're a sinner, that we uh, have been disobeying God, we are not going to turn from ourselves and turn to God. And so no one uh, is going to have God embrace them who hasn't made that kind of commitment. No one is going to have God embrace them who doesn't come to God on God's terms. Look at the scripture. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus said in reply, declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. In John 14.6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then in Mark 10, verse 21 through 25, the scripture says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What is the scripture saying? What is Jesus saying to us this morning? He's making it very clear to us that unless we're born again, we're not going to enter the kingdom of God. He says that plainly. Uh, and if we're going to be born again, we must come through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no one that's going to come except that way. And then in Mark's gospel, as Jesus tries to uh, share with us, he's, he's indicating here was a young man that wanted to come to Jesus, but he had something ahead of Jesus. He was putting his wealth ahead of Jesus. And so Jesus simply asked him to turn aside from that and put his faith in Jesus. But he went away. He, was, he had too much. He wasn't willing to do that. And so he went away from Jesus. The scripture tells us that Jesus loved him, but one thing we notice he didn't change the standard. Jesus didn't say, you know, well, maybe I'll change for you. Maybe there's a, an exception to the rule. He let him walk away. So this morning, the scripture is very plain to us. You will never have an intimate relationship with God without first the commitment. Jesus stated in our text that our commitment to him must be above all other commitments. You know, he talked about even loving those in your family, even loving yourself. Now, the Bible obviously affirms we're to love our family. That's a given. And we're to love ourselves. But notice what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that our commitment to him must be above everything else, even our own self. In other words, Jesus must be supreme in our life if we're to have a relationship with him. So this morning, if you're a believer and you know that you're forgiven, that you're God's child, but you begin to adopt the ways of the world, you begin to look to other things to uh, decide how to live your life instead of looking to the Bible, the scripture says to you very plainly, you're going to sacrifice your relationship with God. You're going to sacrifice intimacy with God. It's not going to to remain the same. God is not going to be near you. He is not going to respond to you. He's not going to do all the things that you would like for him to do if you're not attempting to live for him. And the reason that God refuses uh, an intimate relationship with you is that without the commitment to him above all others, Jesus said very plainly, you cannot be my disciple. In other words, if, if God is not supreme in your life, if Jesus is not supreme, you cannot be his disciple. But not only that, 
without embracing his life and work, there can be no growing relationship with Christ. You know, it's amazing to me that uh, Jesus said very plainly, we can't serve two masters. We're either going to hate the one and love the other. Or, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to serve two masters. We have to make up our mind. Uh, James talks to us that, uh, about the fact that to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. We seem to have confused that. We don't understand that anymore. But that's exactly what James said. If we're to be a friend of the world, we're going to be an enemy with God. The two are not compatible. It seems that so many times if we would grow as a Christian, we don't realize that we have to make a choice, but we do. There's a choice to be made, and it's not choosing the world over Christ. It is choosing Christ over the world. If we're to be what he would have us to be, we need to make that choice. You know, I some time ago had a, a couple that wanted uh, at a marriage renewal to uh, read the words of Ruth, and it's very common in marriages, Ruth uh, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And uh, I'm sure you all know these words by heart, but uh, Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Sounds good, doesn't it? That's the way a marriage is. A marriage is a commitment to each other. Wouldn't it be strange if the uh, focus of their life was different than that? Can you imagine someone saying to their uh, supposed spouse, well, you know, I want you, but I don't want to go where you go. <laughs> I don't want to uh, be what you're going to be. Uh, I, I want you to be mine, but I want to do my own thing. You do your own thing, uh, and I'll do mine. You know, that's not a marriage that's not a commitment to each other. Marriage is about commitment, about you know, wanting the same things, having the same goals, going in the same direction. Many people fail to realize that when we come to God, we have a responsibility. Jesus, when he came to God, he said, I have a cross to bear. I'm to submit to the Father's will. I am to be obedient to the Father's plan. Uh, if you read in Gethsemane, he did not want to go to the cross, but it was the Father's will for him. He was dying for us. He was giving himself as a sacrifice for us. But so he went because it was the Father's plan. Do you realize this morning that we have a plan for our life? And just as Jesus had to submit to the Father's plan, he had to be obedient to what God wanted, that's true for us as well. If we're to be in a relationship with God, if we're to have a commitment to God, we must be willing to do what he is asking of us. We must be willing to go where he asks us to go. Notice that Jesus said that we have a cross. We have a cross. In our text this morning, he said, if we fail to pick up the cross and follow Christ, which is ours, we cannot be his disciple. So isn't that amazing? If anything is before Jesus, if he's not supreme in our life, we cannot be his disciple. If we are unwilling to do what he asks us to do, he says we cannot be his disciple. You know, where have we gotten this stuff? So much of the world has creeped into the church that we have sort of watered down and we we fail to realize that to come to God is a commitment, is a commitment. You know, the church is the bride of Christ, but so many this morning don't find the church worthy of their life. They don't find the church worthy of their time. They don't find the church worthy of their resources. It's just a place they come back to when they need a place to feel all warm and cozy and secure. You know, well, I'll come back to church. But you need to realize this morning that unless you embrace the plan that God has for your life, you know, the church is not going to be what you think it is. God is not going to be close to you. There's not going to be that intimacy. You, so to speak, will be sleeping on the couch. You're not going to use the church for your own benefit. There's a commitment that's required. In Luke's cha uh, Gospel, chapter 9, verses 61 uh, through 62, Jesus said, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, 
No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Do you realize this morning that as we start with God, he's expecting us to continue with him. And if we start and go back, we're not worthy. We're not fit. And so this morning we need to evaluate, what is my relationship with God? Finally, this morning, I think our text would point out to us, until we're aware of the cost, until aware of the cost, we surrender unconditionally to the relationship. God will have no personal relationship with us. Do you realize that? Sometimes people think, well, you know, I was young or I'm this or that, and, you know, I, I was sort of tricked into it. God doesn't trick anyone into a relationship with him. He doesn't catch you in a vulnerable moment and take advantage of you. Instead, God always confronts us with a cost. I would venture to say this morning that not a one of you who believes you're in a relationship with God this morning came to him without realizing that he was to be the master of your life. He was king of kings and lord of lords. He's the boss. And you were submitting to him. You were saying, Lord, please save me. I'm a, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I need the relationship with you. Please come into my life and take control. All of us in some manner said that or we didn't come to God. We started, as Jesus was talking, we started building, right? So we asked the question, why, why are we going back now? Why are we stopping? Why are we not willing to pay the price of finishing with God? Do you realize this morning that Satan laughs at us? We who call ourselves Christians, and we started with God, but then we back off and say, well, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go over there. He laughs at us. We have the opportunity. We have what it takes to finish. But many times we're not willing. Our eyes have wandered to somewhere else. We've given our best to others instead of to Christ who died for us. Jesus went on and said, it's like a, a king who surrenders to another. You surrendered unto God unconditionally. You realize that? You know, like a king with 10,000 going against a, a king with 20,000. If he realizes he can't win, what does he do? He sues for terms of peace while the other's still away, a long way off. You recognize that you could not do it on yourself. There's no way you could save yourself. There's no way you could be right with God. And so you ask God to forgive your sin and to come into your life. You gave up control of everything. That's what the king with 10,000 is doing. He's giving up control of everything. What did Jesus say? Unless you give up control over everything, you cannot be my disciple. And so this morning, you know, we need to understand that without the commitment, without the commitment to God, without first entering into a relationship with him, we are not going to have God be near us. God is not going to bail us out and take care of us. That's not the way it works. God wants us to be intimate with him, but he wants us to have a relationship. The world doesn't want a relationship. The world around you wants to be free to do whatever they want to. They want to be able to change their mind. You know, but as God looks at our life, you know, many of us today are saying here that we have a commitment to God. We have a relationship with God. We're in that relationship. But as God looks at that relationship, is that true? Does he see the relationship active and growing? Think about how you spend your time. Think about how you spend your resources. What is most on your mind this morning? Is Jesus on your mind? You know, the scripture tells us that if Jesus is not on our mind, if we're more concerned about other things than God, the Bible calls that adultery. We have left our relationship with God and we've entered into an adulterous relationship. You know, salt that is not salty is worthless, right? That's what the scripture is saying. Salt that is not salty is worthless. It's only good to be thrown out. Do you realize this morning that a Christian who is not focused on Jesus Christ is worthless? I mean, what, what are we? We're just going through the motions. 
we're calling ourselves something that we're not. This morning, if you're thinking about entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to understand that without first the commitment, without first the marriage, God will have no relationship with you. He's not going to do it. It doesn't matter you know, how handsome you are or how pretty you are. It doesn't matter that you've got a good job. It doesn't matter how uh, loving you are, how wonderful you are. As a person, that has got nothing to do with it. Jesus said, unless he is supreme, unless he's number one, you will not have a relationship with God. And many of you this morning have a relationship. You've entered into that. You've said, well, I, I belong to God. I've given, given him my life. But, you know, if you were honest this morning, you say that, that relationship is not growing. It's not continuing to, to, to be what it wa- once was. You know, the reason for that is, is quite simple. In Revelation 2, verses 4 through 5, it says, You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. One of the things I always tell couples when they're talking about being married is that, you know, there may come a time in their life when they don't feel as close as they used to. There may come a time in their life when they feel like that love has died. Do you realize this morning that there's a simple fix to that? There's a simple fix to that. You know, in a marriage, if you talk with one another, if you touch one another, if you do things that show concern for one another, do you realize that you start back doing the things you did at first, that that feeling will revive, it will come back? It's the same way with Christ. You know, this morning, if you're here and you realize that you're apart from Christ, you're not as close to Christ as you used to be, there's there's a coldness in your life, do you realize this morning that if you'll start praying, if you'll start reading the Bible, if you'll start worshiping, if you'll draw close to God and seek him in the direction of your life, that that closeness will begin to repair itself. You'll begin to feel good again like you first did. God wants to have a relationship with you, but he wants you to realize that it's not going to happen without the relationship first, without the commitment. You see, that's first. That's the primary thing. It's all about the commitment. This morning we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. And as we do, this is an opportunity for you to think about what God did. You see, God deserves first place in our life because of what he paid. You know, Abraham, when he was uh, offering Isaac uh, there, God spared him. But God didn't spare his own son. He allowed him to go to the cross. Why? Because there was no other way. Because we needed it. So this morning, God deserves it. He is worthy of it. We need to give him the place in our life that he deserves. We need to enter into a relationship with him. We need to be what we promised God we would be. This morning, I want to have a word of prayer. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus, I want you to realize this morning that you can come to him. He wants you to come to him. He invites you to come to him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but you're not going to come to him and put other things ahead of him. You're not going to come to him and, and, and want the things of the world. You must see God as worthy of your life. Embrace the cross that he has for you. Follow him wherever that that leads, and he will be near you. If you're here this morning and, and you're already in the relationship, but you've drawn close, why not today say, God, by your grace, I will start back with you. I will be what I promised you I would be. Whatever God is leading you to do as we pray together. Just settle it with God. Be what God would have you to be. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you for the opportunity to observe the Lord's Supper. But as we do, may we realize that it's all about remembering the commitment that you made to us. Lord, help us to evaluate where we are in our commitment to you. And Lord, if if we've drifted, if we're away from what we promised you we would be, I pray that today each of us might turn back to you with all of our heart, that we might remember, that we might repent and be the people that you called us to be. Lord, I pray for those that are here today that don't have a personal relationship with you. Lord, as you draw them, I pray that they'll come and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior.
whatever your will is for the life, help them to be obedient. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. As we have our invitation, whatever God is leading you to do, I encourage you to come this morning. Just as I am without one plea, but then thy blood was shed for me, and that thou beest me come. supper. Those in the balcony will need to make their way down. What we're going to do, we've got the stations here. We're going to ask you to start and come over to this side and come through. You can uh, use any station that you desire. Uh, take the Lord's Supper. Take it to your seat. Uh, take it as the Lord impresses you. But before we do that this morning, I want to read a passage of scripture that's very familiar to us. And Paul's uh, Gospels, he, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and following, he said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then you come around and receive the elements. Think about, though, before you take it, what God has done in your life. Ask yourself a question. Am I still as committed to God as I once was? And if you're not, then let him lead you into what you need to do to be the person God wants you to be. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to observe this supper. I pray that each of us might do it in remembrance of you, we will not realize all that you did for us. May we remember that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. May we realize the broken body that you had for us. Lord, this morning, I pray that as we observe this supper, that it may challenge us to realize that we've made a commitment to you. But where are we? How do you see our life? And Lord, just speak to us about what you would want us to do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.